The next item of business is debate on motion 15507 in the name of Kate Forbes on supporting entrepreneurship. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate? Can I also ask those who are leaving the chamber to do so quietly, please? My goodness. I'll say no more. Right, can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Kate Forbes to speak to and move the motion for nine minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This government, and indeed uh, myself personally as the Minister for the Digital Economy, has made clear that our ambition and our vision is for this nation of Scotland to be at the very forefront of economic and technological development. That means that we must be the inventors and the producers of future innovations, not just their consumers. We know that Scotland's people have more than enough potential to be world leading in many fields. And indeed, we're all very familiar with the innovators and the entrepreneurs of our past. Names like Bell, Fleming and Carnegie. And more recently, names like Farmer, Glogue and Hunter come to the fore. And like Sir Tom Hunter, this government agrees that we must ensure that we work together to make sure that our best days are still ahead of us and that enterprise plays a very positive role for all of society. Now that of course is no mean feat but there is another generation coming through with the ideas, the initiatives and the guts to give it a go and I absolutely believe that we can accomplish that vision if we work together. So it's no wonder then that our approach is based on working with partners to nurture our existing entrepreneurial talent and create the conditions which attract international talent as well. And on that note, presiding officer, I do find it quite startling that the Conservative motion talks about attractiveness when their party has been lambasted in recent, year, recent weeks and years indeed for single-handedly not just turning people off coming to this country, but actively restricting them from entering. Scotland can do embodies our strategy because in sharp contrast to that small-minded, self-obsessed um, approach, um, uh, which in the words of some business organisations is misleading rhetoric on immigration, this government is actively supporting home talent as well as attracting people to move to this country. And our approach through Scotland Can Do is a platform which we've developed with our public, our private and our third sector partners, which represents our shared ambition to become world leading in entrepreneurship and innovation. Now it is paying off, make no mistake, since the introduction of Can Do in 2013, the effectiveness of Scotland's business support environment has risen from 13th in the world to 5th ahead of all other parts of the UK. But I do not think that's enough. I think we need to go further. And that collaboration, which champions an approach where sustainable growth and innovation go hand in hand with the wider benefits to all society, is just the foundation which we must continue to build on. Indeed. Daniel Johnson. Um, I, I thank the Minister for giving way, and I think in, in many ways she's absolutely right. But I'm wondering how her remarks that she just made square with the fact that funding for Scottish enterprises declined by over a quarter since her party came to power. Kate Forbes. I thank the member for that question. And we make clear in the budget, in our draft budget this year, that support for business is at the very heart of that. And our support for our uh, enterprise agencies, which includes, of course, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, as well as Scottish Enterprise, have been treated fairly and consistently. But at the heart is actually the, the output is the benefit that there is to the business community. And the stats that I just quoted in terms of the um, environment that is here, the support environment has risen. These are not my stats, has risen, risen from 13th in the world to 5th ahead of all other parts of the UK, is really where we must look to the support that businesses are telling us that they need and to make sure that that support is not piecemeal, but it's this type of support that business wants. Where our focus has been applied, where we have um, prioritised, such as tackling the gender gap or ensuring that our young people see enterprising activity as the norm, the results have been positive. Where I do think that Labour's amendment actually highlights a very important point is recognising the importance of women in enterprise and um, to ensure that that growth that I've talked about is indeed inclusive. 
And whilst the proportion of women who are actively starting a business has risen significantly since the Women in Enterprise Action Framework was established, there is clearly more to do to make sure that we leave nobody behind. These are achievements. Yes. Oh, sorry, Elaine Smith. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. Um, I do recognise uh, what the Minister has been saying, but I think we also do have to recognise that the statistics show that less than one quarter of new businesses in Scotland are being established by women. I think we should just make that point at this stage. Kate Ford. I appreciate that point and I don't disagree with it. And the point I think would make is that the value, if we were to encourage more women to be able to be in a position to start a business would be enormous for the Scottish economy and making sure that inclusivity is at the heart of our entrepreneurship agenda is not just good for the entrepreneurs themselves but indeed for the Scottish economy as a whole. We recognise that values and diversity must lie at the heart of our can-do philosophy. And organisations like the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the Federation of Small Businesses, have made enormous contributions to those shared outcomes. Young Enterprise Scotland and the Princess Trust have driven action. And as I already mentioned, Women's Enterprise Scotland and Investing Women are tackling some of the challenges that lie around the statistics that Elaine Smith highlighted. And there are, in fact, so many partners responsible for driving, driving that impact that to name them all and their contributions would see us with very little time to debate. One partner, however, who does recognise specific recognition is Entrepreneurial Scotland, which is a network of and for Scotland's entrepreneurs. And it's at the very heart of what we're trying to achieve. At the weekend, I met Rachel Wallace, who works for um, Entre Entrepreneurial Scotland, to ask her, aside from uh, any briefings that I might get, what impact she sees Entrepreneurial Scotland having on the businesses that she is trying to support. And that entrepreneurial drive, which I could see in her herself, um, was very clear that being able to come alongside business and support them in the way that they ask for, rather than the way that the government wants to provide, um, is really making a difference. I briefly touched on, on values. And values has got to be at the heart of our approach. We've stated time and time again that our commitment to economic growth must be inclusive. And businesses that do good are much more likely to be successful and resilient. From the social enterprise strategy to the Scottish Business Pledge and our commitment to being a fair work nation, we have made clear our own position. Dean Lockhart. mentioned inclusive growth. At the Economy Committee, we heard that the government has no agreed definition of inclusive growth. Um, when will the government be able to tell the various agencies involved in the economy what it means by inclusive growth? Kate Forbes. I thank the member for uh, that question. I do recall at one point uh, my uh, colleague asking Dean Lockhart which uh, strategy he thought that the Scottish Government could leave behind and citing inclusive growth uh, being one of them, which of course we would never do. And in terms of inclusive growth, it's quite clear that we ensure that anybody who wants to access the workforce and who wants to access work and who wants to be an entrepreneur is able to do so, that there is a level playing field. But at the other hand, in terms of outcomes, that the outcomes from that growth that we see in the economy benefits everybody. And we don't see the continuing um, a gap between rich and poor that some of uh, Dean Lockhart's colleagues in the Westminster government seem intent on driving bigger. And that means growth for more than its own sake. It means growth where positive social, environmental and community outcomes are a natural consideration. They're not an afterthought or a convenient side effect or a nice subject for a debate in the Parliament. It's growth where everybody is empowered to participate and from which everybody can benefit. And that sentence in itself is quite a neat definition. Yes. Uh, the Minister's in her last minute. Oh. In fact, she's just winding up. Having far too much fun taking... Um, Thank you, uh, presiding officer, in which case I'll rush to the end. We are all aware, and I'm sure we're going to have a very uh, interesting debate, that there are headwinds approaching the Scottish economy that will inevitably impact on the ability of business to thrive. Just yesterday, uh, the CBI again published um, some very uh, scary, for want of a better word, figures for the impact on the Scottish economy in the event of a no deal. These are headwinds caused not by Scotland's businesses, but by decisions made elsewhere. And that more than ever underlines why, must, why we must work together with our partners in business to listen to them and to ensure that our support is right. 
That is the essence of our approach and that is the reason for its success. And I move the motion in my name. I call Dean Lockhart for six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The concept of entrepreneurship reaches back to the work of Adam Smith, and Scotland rightly has a long and proud history of creating new industries. Entrepreneurs in Scotland today continue to play a vital role in our economy, and their success must be recognised. They build new businesses and create new jobs, providing a boost to the local and national economy. They add to national income by generating new wealth and increased tax receipts, and they generate multiplier effects for the economy by creating new products and services. While we all recognise that entrepreneurship is a vital part of the economy, the reality is that no government can legislate for it. You cannot regulate entrepreneurship into existence. Instead, the role of government should be to create a dynamic skills, business and financial environment in which it can flourish. The importance of creating this dynamic environment was highlighted in a recent study by Grant Thornton, which identified that £4.3 billion of business growth is being lost to Scotland because of what they called an environment of barriers, including access to skills, technology, innovation and financial issues. Um, I will in a second. I was about to say perhaps that's why business creation rates in Scotland continue to lag behind the rest of the UK and perhaps that's what John uh, Mason wants to explain. I'll give you. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. He mentioned uh, lack of schools. Does he, is he not concerned that Brexit could lead to a greater lack of schools? Dean Lockhart. Well, the UK government has announced a new immigration policy which is precisely designed to align our immigration policy with the skills needs of the economy. So, no, I don't. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government motion today sets out various initiatives uh, supporting entrepreneurship, and we do welcome these initiatives. But a patchwork list of initiatives is not enough to create the right environment for enterprise. The Government motion also refers to the new Economic Action Plan. But this action plan is merely what the Fraser of Allender has described as a long list of government initiatives recording how money is spent. We need to do more to realise Scotland's entrepreneurial potential. And that's why our amendment today calls for the Scottish Government to take a more fundamental approach, an approach to create a dynamic skills, business and financial environment which truly supports entrepreneurship. I will, yes. Tom Arthur. I'm very grateful to Mr Lockhart for giving me. I completely agree with him that skills is a key issue. And one of the key drivers of skills is, of course, our fantastic university sector. I'm sure Mr Lockhart will welcome as much as I do the figures that were released last week showing 15.6% of university students are from the 20% most deprived areas. And that the Commissioner for Fair Access and Herald today, Sir Peter Scott, said that this, the SNP policy of free tuition fees was vindicated. So let me just... Um, uh, Mr Arthur, Mr. Lockhart, I think that's a long enough intervention. Does Mr Lockhart support uh, Mr. Arthur, Mr Arthur... We are short of time for this debate. I've stated that already. Mr Lockhart. Thank you very much. Let me address uh, the question. In terms of the skills environment, uh, there is a skills shortage in Scotland. It's doubled since 2011. Over the past 10 years, college student numbers have been cut by 150,000. And the CBI has called on the government to do more to fill teacher vacancies in vital subjects such as maths and science. What we're also seeing, and I'd mention this to the Minister as Minister for Digital, we're seeing an increasing digital skills gap emerging in Scotland. The Economy Committee has heard evidence that only 9% of business in Scotland use digital in their business, compared to 43% in other countries. This means that a number of new businesses in digital and technology won't be able to get off the ground unless this digital gap is addressed. And that's why we've been calling for the establishment of a dedicated Institute of E-Commerce, a specialist agency that would help uh, emerging enterprises take full advantage of the global opportunities in e-commerce. I very briefly, please. <laughs> Kate Ford. The member talked about the need for skills. I wonder if you could respond to the FSP who said that um, the UK government's obstinate approach to immigration is going to ensure that non-UK labour and skills will not be there for small businesses to grow and sustain their operations. Dean Lockhart. Thank you. I've already said the UK government has announced a new immigration policy designed to fill the skills gap. In terms of the business environment, we need to promote Scotland as a home for innovators. Entrepreneurs create jobs, they're business developers, and they support economic growth. Not only this, they tend to be top-rate taxpayers, contributing to government's tax revenues. Not surprisingly, we face competition from around the world for those innovators and from the rest of the UK. But instead of trying to attract these innovators to Scotland, the SNP is doing exactly the opposite by making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK for entrepreneurs. 
Yeah. I've given way enough. Sorry. We also need a business environment that encourages entrepreneurs to scale up and expand their business base. But again, we have a government that does the opposite by inflicting the large business supplement on successful firms with the ambition to expand. Presiding officer, nope. Let me turn to enterprise policy. Scotland does have a vibrant startup scene with many entrepreneurs looking to commercialise new ideas and innovations. But again, we see an enterprise policy from the SNP failing to provide the right level of support for startups across Scotland. The Economy Committee is currently concluding an inquiry into business support, including Business Gateway, the primary provider of enterprise support for startups. The committee has heard evidence, however, that because of a lack of funding and a lack of resource, business support for startups across Scotland is inconsistent and lacks expertise. We've also heard evidence that the number of startups receiving assistance has dropped to an eight year low. So if we're serious about supporting startups, we must have a fundamentally, I'm sorry, I'm about He's to just uh, closing. conclude. If we're serious about start, uh, supporting star startups, we must have a fundamentally improved system of startup support. And when the committee presents its final report to Parliament, I urge the Minister to take actions on its recommendations. Presiding officer, after 11 years of SNP government, we have a low growth, low wage, low productivity, and low innovation economy, with levels of innovation in Scotland now in the third quartile of OECD countries. I would remind the Minister that all of these policy areas have been within the control of the SNP for 11 years. If Scotland's true entrepreneurial potential is to be realised, we need to see this SNP government change direction in economic policy and create an environment in which innovation and enterprise can flourish. I move the amendment in my name. I call Rhoda Grant to speak to and move amendment 15507.2. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland has a long history in entrepreneurship. Unfortunately, most of it is historic. We need to lay the foundation that again encourages our entrepreneurial spirit. While there's little to disagree with in the government motion, statements of intent don't really build the foundations that we need to thrive. I attended the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Women's Conference a couple of years ago and they looked at women in business. A number of women addressed the conference and talked about their own experience and for the most part they had gone into business because circumstances forced them to. It was the difficulty of finding work that fitted into caring responsibilities that drove them to set up their own businesses. It was not a career choice or a burning ambition, it was what they needed to do to survive. Women's Enterprise Scotland published a report highlighting the barriers faced by women entrepreneurs. Their recommendations pointed to the inbuilt inequality in the way in which support is provided, meaning women are therefore underrepresented in the sector. That's detrimental to women and to our economy as a whole. Some of the issues that they raise are amplified by others, such as the Federation of Small Businesses, as being true throughout the sector. The fragmentation of support, the missing middle, the transition between business gateway and, enterprise, and the enterprise sector. I've also had constituents who find themselves being passed back and forth between different organisations because the help, help available by one is quite different to the other and many businesses fall between all of them. Yeah. Businesses need seamless support. Yeah. When companies are trading successfully, they then become vulnerable to take over from larger organisations that can then grow that business. And this indicates that there's a risk factor for companies looking to take the next step to grow and export. Uh, therefore, they need support at that point. The loss of ownership of these companies damages our economy. They often become part of larger multinationals, so we lose much of the wealth they create in taxes as well as income. Therefore, if we're to maximise the benefits of entrepreneurship, we need to encourage and grow and nurture these companies. It seems to me that the system does not do that seamlessly. In addition, the support available is not always suitable. Enterprise companies tend to focus on account managed companies which fit a narrow definition while other potentially successful businesses get little or no support. We need to be more open to different business models. Again, the support for these can be fragmented. Co-ops and social enterprise spread risk while providing employment and economic benefit. 
However, their economic impact is sometimes overlooked and therefore they don't get the support required. Very quickly, I'm short of time. Me that some uh, of uh, sorry, Julie Martin, your microphone wasn't on. Is would, no. there, would the grant agree with me that some of the issues around business support is that it looks for too fast a growth and the women led businesses tend to be more about sustainable long term growth? Rhoda Grant. Yes, I, I, I agree with that, but also there are gaps in the, in the support provided and that is most likely to be felt um, by women. And indeed, um, as I was speaking about co-ops and social enterprises where they are overlooked as well. And there are expert organisations that help co-ops and social enterprises, um, but they need ma mainstream support as well uh, to understand and encourage this form of entrepreneurship and to support them and signpost them to that more um, expert organisations where necessary. And the same is true of sole traders in many rural areas. Uh, there is not the opportunity to grow a business because it's filling a niche locally. However, these businesses are crucial and an economic driver in those rural communities. Um, but, and if they fail, there's a detrimental impact to the wider economy, but they are often overlooked because of their inability to grow. Add to that, um, as my colleague Daniel Johnston said, the, the falling enterprise company budgets. It's difficult, therefore, to see how the Scottish Government are supporting entrepreneurship. The Conservative Amendment talks about the Scottish economy growth underperforming against the rest of the United Kingdom, and we agree with that. However, we do not agree that fairer taxation discourages entrepreneurs. Indeed, we believe the very opposite. Austerity damages our economy and with it business opportunities for entrepreneurs. Austerity holds our economy back and those who bear the brunt of that are the least well off in our society and therefore we cannot support the Conservative Amendment. However, austerity, uh, handed, close, please, Ms. Grant. However, austerity handed down from the UK government cannot explain the difference between the Scottish economy and the rest of the United Kingdom. Yes, there is uncertainty you with must Brexit, close, please, but Ms. that Grant. is shared throughout the UK. However, in BREF2, it proves to, to give more uncertainty to Scotland. I move, you must the, close, amendment. Please, Ms. Grant. I move the amendment in my name. Can I say to everyone, we're really pushed for time today and it's largely because of people going over their time and it's unfair to their colleagues. Willie Rennie, four minutes. Thank you for setting me up so nicely, Deputy President Officer. I aim to keep within uh, the four minutes. Um, I do recognise the success of Scotland's entrepreneurial businesses and the contribution they make to employing people across Scotland. Uh, the Chamber need new look no further than the East Nuke of Fife and the village of Pitt and Weem in my own constituency. That, according to the Federation of Small Businesses, is the fourth most enterprising town, with no less than 14.7% of its workers self-employed, an astounding 128% above the national average. I was fortunate to spend 16 hours on the night shift with one of those very businesses, the prawn boat, uh, the Sanella. Uh, I can't say it was particularly easy, I didn't sit down for the whole 16 hours, but it was an example of the dedication that small businesses and business people make uh, towards the contribution towards uh, our economy. Small businesses are responsible for seven out of 10 private sector jobs in rural areas, taking account of over 40,000 jobs in Fife alone, and almost double that in both of Scotland's biggest cities. Yes. Kate Forbes, does the member welcome in particular that two of the most entrepreneurial villages in Scotland are in the Highlands? Uh, well, I, 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 th I think we'll find two of the most entrepreneurial hamlets are in North East Fife. I'm sure if we look at the statistics very closely, we'll find that is very true. Uh, my father uh, was a small businessman himself in the grocery business. Uh, I saw firsthand the dedication, the hours, the heartache that comes with running a business, employing people and meeting the expectations of customers who, of course, were always right. Uh, I want to draw uh, the Minister's attention to the concerns raised by the Federation of Small Businesses surrounding the drop in both registered and unregistered businesses between 2017 and 18. 
The FSB have pointed out they say a decline in the number of Scotland's businesses spells trouble for our ambitions, for our economy and our local communities, and that we need to create a stronger start-up culture. It is important that we take action to promote this culture, as the threat of an undesirable no-deal Brexit looms over our economy. According to the Scottish Government's own website, almost a third of SMEs believed it would be detrimental in, into them. And I looked very closely at the Conservative amendment today, and bizarrely, there was no mention of Brexit in their amendment, but I'm sure that was just uh, an oversight. Um, Women's Enterprise Scotland are right to highlight the barriers that are in place for women as well. We need to redouble our efforts to make that happen. The Scottish Government's economic plan has committed to delivering apprenticeships, as it should. But I want the Minister to go a step further. When asked if they know someone who has started a business in the last two years, the amount of Scottish people who answered yes was way below the UK average. When asked if there are good start-up opportunities where they live within the next six months, the amount of Scottish people who answered yes was below the UK average. Possessing the skills and knowledge to start up a business below the UK average. We've got to do much better than this because as we've seen from the statistics, these SMEs are at the heart of our uh, growth and our economy. So, Mr. Rennie is um, just, just closing. In my last minute, I'm very sorry. Um, so what we need to do is to improve enterprise education in schools. That is the way to create that new culture, to encourage more young people to get into business. So I would urge the Minister to look at enterprise education in schools once again. Thank you, Mr Rennie. We now move to the open debate. Absolutely no more than four minute speeches, please. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Alison Harris. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me uh, start by encouraging Dean Lockhart to uh, walk a couple of hundred metres up the Cannon Gate, cross the road, go into the Cannon Gate Kirkyard in the northwest corner, he'll find Adam Smith's grave. I suggest he reads what it says on it. But I'll just leave that for him for another day. Now, Presiding Officer, um, that, that, uh, the, the, one of the things in the Tory amendment is about business startups. And so I had a quick look uh, at one aspect of that by looking at uh, the company's house uh, figures. And lo and behold, the quarterly figures, because the figures are published quarterly, um, show that the increase in registered companies in Scotland is going at about 4.06% per quarter. Guess what the figure is in England Wales? 4.06% per quarter. So that's very similar. Now, I accept that the base is smaller than Scotland. I absolutely, absolutely I, I really am not going to have time. Do forgive me. Um, so I accept the base is smaller, and there are all sorts of reasons which I can't, uh, in the time available, uh, develop here. I do want to say a little bit about uh, taxation, because, again, the Conservatives are focusing on that. The key thing that helps start businesses is that when you start, you have a tax-friendly regime. And the small business bonus is hardly a disincentive uh, to small businesses. And it isn't replicated anywhere else in these islands. So I think this government has done absolutely extraordinarily well. And of course, by taking away student tuition fees, we're making sure the next generation is equipped uh, to do the sort of things that we need to, I'm not going to, sorry, just for time, I'm halfway through already, so do, do, do forgive me. I, I'm sure it would be worth listening to, but I just don't, uh, just don't have a time. Now, we're supporting, of course, entrepreneurs, um, and we're supporting innovation, because the two are bedfellows. This debate focuses on entrepreneurship. And I think one of the things we've got to be conscious of is that when we support startups and new businesses and new ideas, not everyone we support will ultimately be successful. And one of the things I would want to know, which I found rather difficult to find, is what the failure rates are. Because if they're too low, we're being too unambitious in the way we support uh, companies. In uh, banking, which I worked as a technologist in, if a bank branch had no bad debt, the manager was instantly taken out of position because he was not being ambitious enough in his lending. If he had too much bad debt, he was also taken out and hung, drawn and quartered. So there is a balance to reach. But do recognise uh, that there is risk 
uh, associated with entrepreneurship. There's some outstanding examples, and I, I choose uh, Gillian Martin and my constituency experience as one. Uh, in Frisworth, 10 years ago, two lads started BrewDog. Two people, Le under the age of 30. Today, they've had to move to get a bigger site in Gillian Martin's constituency in Ellen. That company is worth over a billion pounds. And I very much welcome the fact that they're going to be supporting the bids initiative in Peterhead by bringing a brew dog uh, bar uh, to uh, Peterhead's uh, uh, main streets. That's absolutely terrific. I also think, in my very few seconds that I've got left, presiding officer, we need to also think about how we support entrepreneurs, in other words, entrepreneurs inside big companies. Um, best initiative we had at the Bank of Scotland was when Bruce Patullo, in the early uh, 1980s, said our objective is to double the size of the bank in 10 years. If that was the single objective. Everybody in the organisation knew it. We did it in seven. Keep it simple. It works. Alison Harris followed by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the chance to debate the topic of supporting Scotland's entrepreneurs. And I'd like to start by declaring a registered interest in this topic, having started an accountancy practice over 20 years ago. Before looking at how we support entrepreneurs, I think it's important to have a clear understanding of what we mean when we talk about entrepreneurs. When you hear the word entrepreneur, it's easy to think about the huge success stories Andrew Carnegie, Sir Arnold Clark, or Michelle Moan, to list a few. But the term really relates to any individual who sets up an enterprise or business, because they assume the risks and hopefully the rewards that come with this. Entrepreneurs can take many forums, sole traders, partnerships, and small limited companies. And so our local butchers, hairdressers, plumbers, mechanics, restaurants, and nursery owners, they are all entrepreneurs. It's a very different environment to being an employee, as I know only too well. You have the excitement of the potential growth of your business, combined with the extra hours at working at night, and all the responsibility falls on your head. Being in business is not always easy, although anyone who is in business already knows that. There are so many uncontrollable factors that can get in the way of success. And so, taking that into consideration, the best way of supporting entrepreneurs is creating a business-friendly environment. These are the factors that we can control. I think it's also important to have a positive attitude to people in business, where success is truly celebrated and encouraged. The public face people see of an entrepreneur often hides the blood, sweat and tears involved behind the scenes. For entrepreneurs, the associated balance between the risks and rewards of this hard work needs to be perceived as worthwhile. In my region of central, of central Scotland, in Falkirk, it has always stood out as a hub of independent traders and small business owners. The area has been synonymous with these entrepreneurs for decades. However, recently, some figure, some significant cracks have actually started to show. In the recent Business in Scotland 2018 publication, it was revealed that the number of businesses in Falkirk fell between 2017 and 18. This fall was largely driven by a reduction in the number of sole traders and small businesses. We have long argued on these benches that the SNP sends the wrong message to businesses and indeed workers in Scotland. For, if you just wait at the minute till the end, please. For example, many small businesses see no point in scaling up here in Scotland because they will be charged twice the level of large business supplement as they would in England. But last year specifically, the SNP introduced significant income tax changes. These made Scotland the highest tax part of the UK for anyone earning over £26,000. This sends the wrong message to people. It tells them, work harder and you'll keep less of your money. And it does influence business Ms. Harris, decisions just closing. With, the, with the entrepreneur deciding whether it's worth putting in the extra hours and their employees deciding whether to push for a promotion or not. There are clear knock-on effects. It hurts Scotland's already low productivity growth rate. Between 2010 and 2017, productivity in Scotland actually went down. We need to be incentivising entrepreneurs to set up businesses. 
It needs to be as easy as possible for them to scale up these businesses. We need employees to be encouraged to work hard and aspire for these promotions. Creating an environment where we accomplish these simple key principles is the best way for us to support entrepreneurs. Thank you. John Mason, followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you very much. Uh, on the Economy Committee, we've carried out a range of inquiries which touch on the subject of entrepreneurship. And I'll mention some of these as we go along. One inquiry, as has already been mentioned today, has been into business support, which we're just concluding, and that's had a particular focus on Business Gateway. Obviously, we can't go into the detail of our conclusions until they're published, but most of the evidence we've taken it has been in the public record. And I think it'd be fair to say that the picture across Scotland is a bit patchy in uh, regard to Business Gateway. Some entrepreneurs have been very positive about the support and advice they've received from them, while others have been more connected to Scottish Enterprise or HIE, and others have got their business going with little public support. One of the things that has struck me has been the tendency for the children of entrepreneurs to become entrepreneurs themselves. Now, that is absolutely fine, but it leaves us with the challenge, how can we encourage more young people whose parents were employed by public or private sector organisations to think about setting up their own enterprise? The Scotland Can Do website says, quote, an entrepreneurial mindset can be learned and a culture that supports it created, unquote. I agree with that. But the, the statement is that the entrepreneurial mindset can be learned. However, I do not think that it is necessarily easily learned and will depend partly on the mindset that someone has to start with. Speaking personally, my father was an engineer and my mother was a teacher. And I don't think I ever seriously considered starting a business of my own. I assumed I would work for some organization as they had, and that is broadly what I did in my career as an accountant. So the first challenge is to get more businesses started but the second challenge is to get our entrepreneurs to grow them and not to have them sold off too soon because they have, before they have really fulfilled their potential. And that is sometimes called the fear of heights. If it's very quick. Liam Kerr. Uh, just effective broadband is clearly crucial to entrepreneurship, whether starting up or scaling up. So does the member have any idea when we'll see full coverage of broadband in the northeast where I am? John Mason. Yeah, I, I think that is important, but I think it's a little bit off the subject of today's debate. Uh, whereas a company like Skyscanner grew to a considerable size while it was independent and therefore was sold off for more serious money when the time came, other companies have been sold off, as I think Rhoda Grant was saying, uh, at a much earlier stage. And the feeling is that the Scottish economy as a whole has not benefited as much as it might have. Now, once again today, I find myself strongly disagreeing with the Conservative Amendment. Uh, here we have a party which keeps the major levers of the economy reserved to Westminster and is quick to claim the credit if they reckon their actions have contributed to economic growth. Yeah. Yet London has been running the Scottish economy for over 300 years, whereas the Scottish Parliament has only had some involvement for the last 20 years. Perhaps, just perhaps, the reason the Scottish economy has not done so well at times and risks continuing not to do so well in the future is that London is running the show. As an example, Scottish unemployment is at a welcome low level. But the other side to that is that we do not have a lot of extra people available for any new jobs that might come along in the future. And there could well be a skills shortage fairly soon. With Brexit and the potential for Westminster stopping workers coming to Scotland, of course our economy would be likely to suffer in that regard. Surely the Conservatives would accept that if the Scottish economy suffers more because we need immigration and they put on immigration controls, then it is the Westminster Government which is responsible for the Scottish economy doing less well. I have slightly less problem with the Labour Amendment, but they seem to want more expenditure and they don't tell us where the money is coming from. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Elaine Smith to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. And can I just say that I have a voluntary registered interest as a non-remunerated director of McQuick Limited Bagpipe Covers. Entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes and from all walks of life. They might be big business tycoons, some of which were mentioned in the opening speech, inventors, or someone turning a hobby or a skill into an idea for a small business venture. Unfortunately, though, what they most predominantly are is male. 
Therefore, I intend to focus on the issue today of women as entrepreneurs. In the Scottish Government's Economy Action Plan, as part of the Driving Entrepreneurship Paper, it's made clear that collective efforts must be broadened to address the needs of women in enterprise and the creative sector. We're all well aware that new businesses are a key driver of economic growth, and as such, it's vitally important that people get the help and support that they need to ensure success. Small business startups are not only good for our economy, but also for helping individuals into employment, both the business owner and those that they might employ. The Minister mentioned um, in the opening speech about the widening poverty gap, and of course it used to be that employment was a guaranteed way out of poverty, but clearly that is no longer the case. With one in four Scottish children living in poverty and two thirds living in households where at least one person works, we can see that a job is not always the way out of poverty. And in terms of poverty, it is women who are amongst the poorest in our society and therefore supporting more women into business um, and breaking down the barriers is particularly important. The Scottish Government's action plan for women in enterprise does seek to address a number of the challenges um, to women in business, but it is needed because women are still underrepresented in self-employment and in business ownership. Now, I noted that £400,000 was specifically earmarked for this financial year to help initiatives focused on women, such as the Ambassadors Programme. But I would be grateful for a comment from the Minister uh, in summing up, because clearly we don't have time for interventions, unfortunately, about whether some funding can be specifically focused on tackling the lack of startups in areas of higher deprivation, women suffering health inequalities, and among those living in poverty and exclusion in general. And part of that uh, could include specific funding for projects working with women with complex health needs for whom the mainstream labour market doesn't always fit. Personal control and flexibility is important in such cases, so I would be grateful for comment on that. Women working in agriculture is also a specific area that needs more attention. At a recent women's dinner in the Scottish Parliament, hosted by myself and other women MSPs, Sarah Allison, Vice Chair NFU Next Generation Group, spoke passionately about the opportunities for women in the farming and agricultural sector and the role that we can all play in supporting them. The Scottish Government's Women in Agriculture Task Force has been working on this issue, presiding officer, and has just published an interim report. And the recommendations for training in that include short courses designed for women new to farming, practical as well as financial and management training courses targeted at women, and courses targeted at women to take into account their needs, including childcare. I believe this approach is already showing positive results, challenging the stereotypes of agriculture and farming as an all-male preserve. Finally, I would like to highlight the importance of harnessing women's existing skills and taking them seriously as a business proposition. One of the challenges in ensuring that women's business ideas, um, for example, jewellery making or beautician, etc., are not dismissed as hobbies and that they receive the, re the support and the respect that they deserve. Sometimes relatively small amounts of funding can be enough to start up such a business, but getting that funding can be extremely difficult for many women. Presiding officer, I do support the government motion, but I support the Labour amendment and I certainly do not support the Tory amendment. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, presiding officer. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce and Evidence to the Economy Committee stated that Scotland has an enviable level of support for developing businesses delivering th delivered through local authorities, primarily via Business Gateway, the enterprise agencies and private sector organisations such as the Chambers of Commerce. Scotland is the fifth most effective environment for business support globally, up from 13th in 2013. This finding was supported by research carried out by the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship at Strathclyde University, identifying that Scotland's profile improved both absolutely and relative to benchmark nations. If it were a nation state, it would rank fifth when included with the 28 innovation-driven nations on the Global Entrepreneurship Development Institute Index for the 2012 to 2015 period, comfortably within the upper quartile and behind only the United States, Australia, Denmark and Sweden. The most recent official figures for the number of registered businesses in Scotland records a 16% growth since 2007, with over 28,000 new businesses, 
including sole traders and partnerships, which grew from 54,000 to just under 69,000. In order to support new entrepreneurs and existing businesses to grow, there is a range of support from business incubators to innovation centres, in addition to the enterprise agencies and business gateway. Some might see that as cluttered, but the outcome is that Scotland's business survival rates are above the UK average. Scotland is ranked first out of the UK's 12 regions for two-year and three-year survival rates. When it comes to the five-year survival rate for businesses born in 2012 and still active in 2017, Scotland's rate was 44%, again above the UK average. We do not often hear about business death rates, but again, Scotland is performing better with a business death rate of 11%, lower than the UK average, with London, the region with the highest business death rate, with over 86,000 businesses failing in 2017. Presiding officer, in Edinburgh, the business support landscape has supported the city in becoming one of the economic hotspots of the UK. Codebase is the UK's largest startup incubator, home to more than 100 of the country's best te technology companies, bringing together entrepreneurs, world-class technological talent and top investors. In my constituency of Edinburgh Pentlands, the Edinburgh Business School, located at Heriot Watt University's Rickerton campus, has a startup incubator where successful applicants are offered free space and fully equipped offices for, for one year. In addition to the desk space, the budding entrepreneurs have access to workshops, training and expert advice. In terms of business accelerators, Edim, uh, Edinburgh has Scotland's first specialist fintech hub at the RBS HQ at Gogoburn, where innovative fintech entrepreneurs and startups have access to similar expertise. Startup finance is critical in ensuring that new businesses get to the point where they can start trading. And the Scottish Government is investing in the Scottish Ed Edge Fund competition, which has had 12 rounds so far, investing in 350, bill 350 bill businesses with 130 million of additional turnover and 1,600 jobs. Uh, I also welcome the proposal to reopen the Scottish Stock Exchange here in Edinburgh, creating 60 highly skilled jobs. So, presiding officer, in just the last year, the number of employers based in Scotland has increased by 900. If we can become the best place in the world to do business, then many more new and existing small businesses will grow to become employers, making our economy stronger. Thank you very much. And I call Tom Mason to be followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Scotland's current economic performance can only be described as mediocre. Growth forecast is is lower than the UK as a whole for the next four, four years, and GBT growing half as quickly. Productivity at its lowest level in nearly nine years, a far cry from the Scottish Government's goal being in the top quarter of OECD countries. Target set, target missed. So we need to, need to do considerably better. It follows then that we must find ways of improving performance and productivity wherever we can. Slicker ways of working, less cluttered regulation and, and bureaucracy, and a much more enterprising nation, with new ways of working, new markets, products, and innovation in all that we do. Now, innovation comes about by experiment and risk-taking, and we look to entrepreneurial activity to achieve the success, we, success we, we need, to progress the economy at a much faster rate than we do at present. However, at best, examples of entrepreneurship are when individuals are able to take calculated risks that take advantage of market conditions, knowledge and experience. Therefore, innovative processes should take place both on a large scale in terms of business startups and on small scale in every department in organisations across Scotland. I once asked the chief executive of a leading venture capital company who best to invest in, and he replied, the person who really knows their market and has failed at least once, better twice. We need the element of calculated risk to push the boundaries of what we can achieve. I'm reminded of the words of George Bernard Shaw, who in 1903 said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt to the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on unreasonable man. And I apologize to females on that quote. 
So we, we need to find ways of encouraging such risk-taking, and if they fail, the consequences should be, not be too burdensome. With this in mind, investment in business support is vital. Not a cluttered line shout. Quick one. Kit. Minister Kate Forbes. Can the member confirm whether he is voting for a Labour's motion which asks for more money, as well as his own motion as, uh, asking for a tax cut? Tom Mason. No, I'm wanting for an environment where business enterprise and entrepreneurs can flourish. Money isn't necessarily the vital part of it. We need to fix flatlining R&D spending, and the worst in, as we are the worst in the OECD countries bar New Zealand. We need to sort out our unacceptable skills gap, which has doubled since 2011. We need to ensure that local communities have the powers they need to be reactive, flexible, and in order to deal with the unique challenges they face. We need to properly help the high street and take account of e-commerce. In order to com compensate for risk, we must reward success where it occurs, encouraging investment and, importantly, profit profitability. Sadly, the presiding officer, this is not the approach that was taken by the SNP. A business supplement doubled out of the rest of the UK puts Scottish business at a competitive disadvantage. Not my words, those of the Scottish Chamber of Commerce. Where's the incentive when Scottish businesses are paying an extra 190 million in taxes every year? This, must, this government must incentivize innovation, not treat it like a cash cow. We have so much potential as a nation, presiding officer. But we cannot realize it until such time as this right support is available from the Scottish government. The current approach isn't working as it should. If everything was fine, we wouldn't have the fewer business, businesses across the country than last year, and all, all productivity at the lowest level since 2010. So I urge the government to think carefully about what has been said here today, work constructively towards developing policies that are much, for work, much better working, allowing innovation and entrepreneurship to flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in the last of our open debate speeches, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Once again, I get the opportunity to highlight a significant number that I often mention when talking about Scotland's enterprise potential, and that number is 7.6 billion. That's how many pounds would go into the Scottish economy if the same amount of women as men started up in business every year. And the Labour Amendment makes specific reference to the work done by Women's Enterprise Scotland. And I'd like to take this opportunity to recommend that Rhoda Grant and Elaine Smith come along to my cross-party group in Women's Enterprise, for which WES are the Secretariat. We've done some great work over the last three years, including set, um, securing funding for WES and the training, enterprise training for women. Yes. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, just very briefly, I haven't been along. I will try and get along, but I did read some of the minutes and very interesting they were. Gillian Martin. Thank you. You would be most welcome, as would everybody else. Many of the women we've heard from in our cross-party group have been innovators, particularly in tech. We've also had sessions on women in agriculture, heard from women in areas of multiple professions starting up in business, and have done a lot of work on access to finance and business support, usually concentrating on the lack of both for women and the unsuitable, un unsuitability of current enterprise structures, which can be missing out on women's potential due to unconscious bias. In WES research, we found out that women-led businesses view growth as a sustainable, long-term process rather than a fast, high trajectory. And if you fit in the middle between small business and very large business, you can also uh, be subject to not um, being able to apply for quite a lot of support. The focus on a broader community me measures such as employment, fair working practices, quality of service and product rather than just turnover. And over three quarters of respondents to a recent WES survey stated that services should be more aware of the differences in support needs between women and men in business, with appropriate peer support being listed as particularly desirable. And that brings me on to this week, the deadline for applications for business ambassadors for Women's Enterprise Scotland. And I'm hopeful that one of my constituents, Lindsay Ritchie, will apply for that. Lich, Lindsay embodies the can-do spirit mentioned in the government motion. A small unit in the village of Newmarker, her business Kilt with Hay, ships international uh, traditional Highland dress and gift items all over the world. She employs seven local people and a work experience student. And that's seven people not having to commute into the city for work. Small businesses in small towns and villages providing local opportunities are good for high streets, they're good for the environment and they're good for working parents. I also want to point out that Lindsay and so many other small businesses in my area are able to have premises with a shop front because of the small business bonus, thanks to the increase in the ceiling. The majority of high street businesses in my constituency now qualify for this vital support. 
Before I close, presiding officer, I want to also mention low carbon innovation. For me, it's been very interesting leaving the economy committee as a member and moving on to convene the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. And through our deliberations on the government's climate change bill, it's been glaringly obvious to me that our business and innovation support agencies would do well to have a focus on the potential of shepherding businesses who can be part of the low carbon revolution, whether that be in the tech for renewable energy, bioscience that improves soil conditions, plant health and feed for livestock, or innovative agribusiness. There's a wealth of knowledge and innovative thinking in our environment and agriculture sector in Scotland that could be nurtured and could be exported to lead the way in the world as we face up to our climate change responsibilities. It really is ours for the taking if we have that focus. Untapped enterprise potential, that is the key to economic growth in Scotland. But it's also the key to so many of this government's priorities. Equality of opportunity, environmental sustainability, fair work, innovation and internationalisation. Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And we move now to closing speeches. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And with four minutes, this feels more like I'm taking part in a pitching competition than summing up a debate. But let me give it a go. Um, obviously, I need to refer members to my uh, register of interest. I am a non-working, non-remunerated director of a retail uh, business. I'm also a member of the FSB. And bearing that in mind, I've always struggled a little bit with the term entrepreneur. When you think of entrepreneur, you either think of Mark Zuckerberg or Del Boy, and I never felt I, I was either one of those things when I was working in business. What I did feel like I was constantly chasing my tail trying to keep all the plates spinning, trying to make sure that I was making progress in my business. And I think one of the real points of consensus has been in the, the debate that that is the essence of what an entrepreneur is. It is about hard work, but it's also about making the most of both your talents and the talents of those that you are working in your business. I think that was a point made very well by Rhoda Grant in, in her uh, uh, contribution. And I think it's also why it's right that we do focus not just about the whizzy high-tech businesses, but also about those people uh, who are uh, working very hard in, in more day-to-day -day businesses and looking at how we can support them to make, so that they can make the most of those talents that they are seeking to use. So looking at the debate this afternoon, there is much that we, we can uh, agree on. And indeed, I think I'd also refer to the debate that we had last week looking at uh, 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 investment and business support and labour time. And I think there were two points of consensus there, that we do need to see how we can grow our middle-sized companies, and that needs to be done through a comb combination of investment and support. I think those are points that we can all agree on. And on that point, while I think there was much that we can agree on with the government's motion, unless we're really looking at, about how we can genuinely stimulate that growth, tackle the underlying issues of productivity, there is a danger that the government's motion is piecemeal. But likewise, I think there is real issues with the Tories' approach to the debate this afternoon. Uh, there was much in Dean Lockhart's contribution that I could agree with. I mean, I agree with him that we need to have the right environment for enterprise. I agree with him that there's a danger, that there's a patchwork of approaches and organisations. I agree with the need to do better on the digital skill gap. I agree with him that we need to fund business support more effectively. But how that translates into a motion that simply talks about lowering taxation as the sole instrument, the sole device through which we support our enterprises simply makes no sense to me. Because while I agree no business person likes paying tax, the reality is that growing businesses is much about infrastructure that we invest through the public sector. It's about skills which we provide through our education sector. It's about making sure that we can plug those skills gaps, support businesses which need to grow to take new opportunities, which again is about business support. It is about the, the, the state and the private sector working in partnership. That requires public sector investment. The last time I checked, the best way of doing that is through taxation. And if you have an issue with that, if the Tories have an issue with that, may I gently point them in the direction of the Scandinavian countries or Germany, which have significantly higher levels of taxation, but seem to do significantly better than we do in terms of productivity. And on a final, I don't really have time. Um, 
we must also celebrate the successes we do have here. And I think Gordon MacDonald did a, a very good job in terms of pointing out some of the successes right here in this city. We have a, a turnover from tech businesses of 1.14 billion, 212 startups in the last year, 10,000 uh, tech jobs directly, 38,000 in associated uh, efforts. And if we look at the why, it's because we have a highly successful university that has acted as a conduit of knowledge exchange and collaboration. And therein, I think, lays a hint as to where future success may lie for future enterprise policy in this country. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I call Jamie Halcrow Johnson to close for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, we've seen a welcome focus from governments at all levels on the, um, on the need to back innovation, and I welcome some of the comments the Minister has made today. In what's been far too short a debate, uh, we've heard a number of positive contributions from around the Chamber, and I'd like to draw attention to just a few of them. My colleague Dean Lockhart um, highlighted the increasing digital skills gap emerging in Scotland, something which we will be concerned about. And as he mentioned, the Economy Committee, in which we both sit, heard evidence that no, only 9% of business in Scotland embed uh, digital in their business. That's compared to 43% in competitor countries. There is a digital skills gap we have to address as a country. And I agree wholeheartedly when Dean Lockhart calls for the establishment of a dedicated institute of e-commerce to help emerging entrepreneurs take full advantage of global opportunities in e-commerce. Alison Harris was right to point out that when we think of entrepreneurs, too often we think of the huge success stories, the Andrew Carnegie's and Arnold Clark's, or as Daniel Johnson mentioned, the Dell Boys. But serial and successful entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes, from the person who sets up and runs a business employing thousands of staff, to the person who may employ five or ten people. But their reasons for starting their own business may well be the same. And Tom Mason made a really important point when he highlighted the fact that many entrepreneurs fail at least once. But what differentiates them from others is that they get up, dust themselves off, and give it another go, sometimes more than once. They learn from their mistakes, and it's their determination that drives them on. Daniel Johnson also uh, highlighted the cuts to the budgets of, the Scottish, Enter of Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. He, I haven't got time. We've only got, a, we've only got a very short debate. Maybe more time should be put in for what is an important subject. Um, he could also have mentioned that Highlands and Islands Enterprise also underspent on its budget for broadband rollout by over 45% last year. Willie Rennie has seemingly launched uh, the Entrepreneurial Hamlet of the Year Awards coming soon to the International Conference Centre Pitt and Weem. Get your tickets as soon as you can. Uh, Elaine Smith touched on uh, women in agriculture and it's a good opportunity to mention the sisters Kirsty and Amy Budge from, uh, who are the country file farming heroes in Shetland. Um, and uh, the Minister and others also highlighted the importance of addressing the barriers to women entrepreneurs. This is all uh, part of the Labour amendment that we can agree with. Unfortunately, we also feel that the amendment uh, seems to discourage foreign investment into Scotland, which is a wrong message to send. So we won't be supporting the Labour amendment today. Entrepreneurship and encouraging more entrepreneurs is an issue around which we can hopefully build some consensus. There appears to be a recognition across this chamber, chamber that there have been shortcomings in our approach in the past and the need to improve in the future. Scotland has suffered too many years of slow growth and failing to effectively upsize business from startups to significant sized organizations. As I've already mentioned, in common with a number of speakers today, I have the advantage of sitting on the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee in recent months during our business support inquiry. We've heard a great deal of evidence about the functioning of both the enterprise agencies and at a local level business gateway. These will be, be key bodies in driving forward a cultural change in supporting uh, in support of entrepreneurialism. One thing that does seem odd to me, however, is that Business Gateway, as a local authority-run service, does not seem to be better integrated to the other function of local authorities. If we are to embed enterprise earlier in the consciousness of young people, surely organizations like Business Gateway can make, a more con can make more of a contribution through their respective councils. More widely, there has been a very positive focus on collaboration today, and that is welcome. However, if we wish to see entrepreneurship have equal status in terms of careers we signpost to young people, we must give it parity of esteem. That will involve incorporating entrepreneurship at all levels. There are clearly unharnessed opportunities to build, entre build entrepreneurial skills as part of apprenticeships. I certainly know of one former plumbing apprentice who has all the skills to be a plumber and having set up their own business is now having to learn how to run that business with all the additional skills that requires. He felt even the most basic business training as a part of his entrepreneurship would have been extremely helpful when he started down the road to setting up on his own. 
And while I was slightly disappointed when speaking to a group of about 12 MSYPs in Parliament last year, only one showed interest in starting up their own company. I appreciate this is not necessarily reflective of the aspirations of young people. Because I can also highlight the case of Australia in Orkney, uh, who are in uh, Kirkwell Grammar School's young enterprise team of 2017-2018. Uh, and they've gone on to be crowned co Scottish Company of the Year. Uh, we must ensure that every young person who grows up in Scotland receives a rounded, uh, edu uh, rounded enterprise education, not only opening up new horizons, but also providing them with the practical skills required to run a small business. Presiding officers, this side of the chamber will welcome any new work from the Scottish Government to support entrepreneurs and break down some of the barriers that exist to starting up new businesses. Sadly, however, there's many policies of the, this SNP Government that are holding Scottish business back. So long as the SNP continues to be an administration that values tax rises above creating an environment for the private sector to succeed, our economic growth will suffer. So too will our productivity, which this government pledged in 2000, its 2016 manifesto to tackle. Instead, the gap with the rest of the UK is at, is at its widest level since 2012. Instead, we can and should be ambitious about our entrepreneurs and clear about the ways in which we can allow a truly entrepreneurial spirit to flourish in Scotland. Thank you very much. And I call on the Minister to conclude this afternoon's debate. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank all members for their con contribution to today's debate. And above all else, I hope that um, entrepreneurs the length and breadth of this country feel that we have paid tribute to their efforts, whether they are in the hamlets of Fife or the villages of the Highlands or the streets of Edinburgh. They're the ones um, that have uh, the success and who get up and go um, and who bear a lot of the risks of what we do. And many perhaps, I think, um, of the issues that we've discussed today deserve time for greater reflection than we've been able to manage today. And it's clear, quite rightly, that supporting all of Scotland's people to realise their potential, no matter where they choose to realise it, is a priority that we all share. And that endeavour has to be a collective one. I want to start, though, by talking again about the Conservative amendment and the hypocrisy within it when it comes to talking about attracting people to this country. Because this is a party who gave up on attracting people to the country years ago with its restrictive immigration uh, rhetoric and anti-immigration policies. And those anti-immigration policies have been lambasted by business over the course of the last few weeks for jeopardising the economy, for damaging the economy, for devastating the economy. And this is a government in the UK who, in the words of one business organisation, seems hell-bent on ignoring the business community when it comes to its immigration policy. So when it comes to attracting people, the Conservatives might want to figure out how to attract people before they lecture others on attracting people. But back to supporting um, Scotland's people and choosing to invest in Scotland's talent as well as attracting people to this country. That Scotland can do approach again makes clear that we'll only be able to do that if we are working across society with private, public and third sector partners. And I want to touch on a, a number of issues that members have raised. First of all, when it comes to growth support. And along with RBS and the Hunter Foundation, we created and continue to support the Scottish Edge Fund. Now, this private partner spun out of Scottish Enterprise has, since 2013, awarded over £13 million to 350 businesses, supported the creation over, of over 1,600 jobs, with an increase of over £130 million of turnover, and helped to secure um, over £100 million of additional investment. And following our economic action plan, the commitment to amplify can do, Scottish Enterprise has invested a further £1 million into Scottish Edge. I want to also pay tribute to Gillian Martin and the Cross Party Group on Women in Enterprise and Aileen Smith's um, comments. In 2014, we launched with Women's Enterprise Scotland the first policy framework to tackle the enterprise gender gap and the first anywhere in the EU, and now progressing through the Women in Enterprise Action Group with many other partners, and it's so important that we are working with other partners, which include Investing Women, the FSB, Scottish Chambers of Commerce, and the Association of Scottish Businesswomen. We are together trying to drive change because we recognise that figure that Gillian Martin quoted about the huge impact to the Scottish economy if the start-up rate amongst women entrepreneurs was the same as men. 
And it's by working with and listening to those partners that we have started to achieve progress. Now, Elaine, Mar Elaine Smith specifically asked about um, investment. And I wanted to draw members' attention to the new digital fund, which was in the budget, um, which I will be taking forward and specifically focuses on providing grant support to those who are furthest from the labour market to get the digital skills they need, the tech skills that they need, which are so needed uh, in our economy today, to expand the workforce and to provide them with the sport, recognising that in particular, I would like to encourage women to be part of accessing that fund, as well as others who are furthest from the, the labour market. Yeah. Dean Lockhart. Th thanks very much. On the point of digital uh, skills and as Minister for Digital Skills, does she support our calls for the establishment of a dedicated institute of e-commerce? Minister. I support um, individuals and businesses who want to improve what they're doing digitally. We recognise that at the moment um, industry tells us that we need about 12,800 new entrants to the digital workforce in order to stay that keep standing um, uh, without even starting to realise the huge opportunities that come with digital. And we're ensuring we're putting in place right now the, the digital funds, the digital growth funds for business as well as individuals to make sure that businesses recognise the opportunities and individuals um, take advantage of the opportunities to retrain. Our shared mission is of an entrepreneurial society, and that actually starts with government as well. It means government needs to value an entrepreneurial mindset that we then export, ex support externally. And we want to see that entrepreneurial mindset within government. And we want to support startups, particularly through our procurement approach. And a core part of that approach is through CivTech which is an innovative project that works with the public sector to disrupt normal procurement models and puts out problems for small com companies to work towards. And that can often be the first step for um, small and medium-sized entrepreneurial businesses um, to get their foot through the door. So I think it's true that as I come to a close now, there is much to be optimistic about in terms of the business startup and the growth rates in Scotland. We are seeing success. We know that internationally, Scotland is the fifth most effective environment for business support globally. That is something to celebrate. But in light of the UK government's damaging proposals, not just when it comes to market access, but also in immigration, we know that we need to work even harder to make sure that Scotland's an attractive place for skills and talent, and that entrepreneurs choose to set up a business here in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on supporting entrepreneurship. Point of order, Mike Rumbles. Um, under Section 27A of the Scotland Act, the participation of the Scottish law officers, it says, and I quote, they may participate in the proceedings of the Parliament to the extent permitted by standing orders. If I can turn to standing orders, Rule 4.5, it says, participation of the Scottish law officers in proceedings. One, this rule applies where the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General are not members of the Parliament. Two, the Scottish law officers may participate in any proceedings of the Parliament as fully as any other members, except for voting and membership of the corporate body and parliamentary bureau. Three, these rules apply to the Scottish law officers when participating in any proceedings of the Parliament as if they were members. Earlier in portfolio questions on justice and the law officers, I asked the Lord Advocates what the Lord Advocates' position is on the Scottish Government's competency to authorise another referendum on Scottish independence without a Section 30 order. Please note, Presiding Officer, that my initial question, I didn't ask what his advice was to the Scottish Government. I asked directly what his view was. The Lord Advocate was present, the Lord Advocate was present in the Chamber, but the Scottish Government chose to have the Minister for Parliamentary Business respond. Now, I have to say, over the years, I hadn't thought of asking about the Lord Advocate's view, and because he's, always, he's head of the prosecution service, and pr previously he's always answered questions to do with prosecutions. But last year, he entered the fray with the European Continuity Bill and responded to questions from MSPs in this chamber on his duties in there. So... In my earlier point of order, the Deputy Presiding Officer quite correctly pointed out that Standing Order Section A31 allows any minister 
to respond to an oral question in the chamber. So the letter, if not the spirit of standing orders, was complied with. I accept that entirely. That's all that matters, I hear. But it isn't. Could I therefore ask you, presiding officer, as chair of the Parliamentary Bureau, to have the Bureau re-examine Parliament's standing orders to see if in this instance they are fit for purpose in allowing members in this chamber to directly question our law officers on their duties as they see them. If you, presiding officer, will raise this in the Bureau and the Bureau decides that the standing orders in this case needs revision, could you outline the process that then needs to be followed? Thank you. Can I, can I thank Mr. Rumbles? Order, please. Can I thank Mr. Rumbles for advance notice of his point of order? Can I also assure him that uh, I did follow all the earlier proceedings. I heard the question that the member put. I heard the response from the Minister for Parliamentary Business. I heard the further exchange with the uh, Deputy Presiding Officer in the chair. And as the member has highlighted, um, the response which the member recognises is right, that it is up to the government to choose which minister to put forward to respond to questions to the government. Uh, having said that, I've looked further into this matter, and whilst I recognise the point and the concern that the member raises, it's in fact not for the Bureau to look at standing order changes. It's for, these are matters for the procedures, uh, for the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Uh, if the uh, member wished to proceed further, he may wish to write to that committee. That committee could in turn, of course, ask the Bureau for uh, the Bureau's views, but that would be the procedure to follow. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to proceed now to the next item of business, which is a consideration of business motion 15515 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? The presiding officer moved. Thank you very much. Uh, and no one wishes to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 15515 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The next item is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. Could I ask Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 15514 on approval of an SSI and 15552 on a committee meeting at the same time as the Chamber? Move, Presiding Officer. Thanks very much. And we turn now to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 15507.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend motion 15507 in the name of Kate Forbes on supporting entrepreneurship, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15507.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart is yes, 28, no, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 15507.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Kate Forbes, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment uh, number 15507.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 82, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the next question is that motion 15507 in the name of Kate Forbes as amended on supporting entrepreneurship be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 11507 in the name of Kate Forbes as amended is yes, 76, no, 27. There were six abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 11514 in the name of Graham D on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 1552 in the name of Graham Day is yes, 82. There were no votes against. There were 27 abstentions and the motion is therefore agreed. And our final question this evening is that motion 1... Uh, yes. Uh, I've read out the number on the last motion. The last motion was 15514. Uh, but it was agreed. This motion is motion 1552 in the name of Graham Day on a committee meeting at the same time as the Chamber. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move now to members' business in the name of Colin Beattie on celebrating the reach of adult learning. And we'll just uh, take a few moments for members and for the Minister to change seats. <laughs>